Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, as I've done every time in the past, I will ask, are there any, anybody here who hasn't been to one of these before? Yes. You haven't been to one before? No? Everyone's been here? Yes? Okay. So we do have one new person tonight. So. Bob. Yes? Okay. How's that? Okay, so here's our agenda for tonight. Um, last time we met, we took a survey of preferences about various building elements. Since uh, no one has seen that, this will be your chance to see what the results are from that survey. And then uh, Tom Rengstork will be here tonight. He's going to deliver some terrific ideas for various components of the landscape design. And there'll be another follow-on survey uh, at the end of that for you guys to express your preferences about the various design options that he's going to be showing. As usual, here's our timeline. So we are headed towards our big presentation, our big deliverable is June 21st, and that's where we're going to have the full package. It'll have the landscape design, it'll have the building design, it'll have the cost estimate. And so we'll meet here, we'll show you all of that. There'll be uh, opportunity for all kinds of conversation. Uh, yes, Mike. When, uh, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Could you explain why it's the 21st and not the 20th after I told everybody at the board meeting that it was going to be the 20th? Um. <laughs> Speak in the mic. Okay. <laughs> we, no, this is not a, a, a I just want to yeah. make sure people understand okay. what the day is. Okay, I apologize for that, that it didn't get explained fully. The 20th, the museum was not available and we were missing some key people. We looked at dates around the 20th and we had available the 21st and we were able to get this room. So we went ahead and nailed down the 21st rather than the 20th. That, that date should be firm at this point. It should not move again. Does that help? Thank you, yes. Okay, so on the 21st. Uh, previous to that, on the 8th, we will be with the Renovation Committee to preview uh, the design and the materials that we'll be showing. Those, those meetings have actually been really helpful for us to uh, hone in the message, uh, test out the options, make sure that uh, what we're saying uh, is concise and uh, is in a package that people are ready to hear. And then there it is again, June 21st, That'll be the big meeting where we show the final design with the cost estimate. So right now we are assembling uh, the information from the last meeting, the preferences, into a package that we're giving to the general contractor and working out the details. And then they're gonna spend the next couple of weeks putting together pricing on the various materials and estimating all the various parts and pieces in the project. Uh, here they are. We should probably make t-shirts with this. Here's our project goals. Always the same, stabilize the buildings and the structures, eliminate safety issues, reduce ongoing maintenance costs, and improve the aesthetics and marketability of the project. All right, Kyle, you ready? Yeah. Okay. Here's your tool. All right, for anyone who doesn't know, doesn't know who I am, uh, my name's Kyle Coots. I'm a designer over at Coates Design. Um, I'm the doer of the team in a way. Uh, Bob and Matthew are the brains and they tell me how to do everything and you know, so I, I produce all this stuff and I help Matthew fix computers when it doesn't work right, so that, that's me. Um, so if you all recall, last time we presented three design options of materials, three options of unit deck handrails, as well as, uh, let's see what else did we do. Uh, doors on the decks, um, and then some overall, just overall design issues and concepts. So we'll show you the results of those. We had 46 units, 46 units um, respond to the survey, so we had a pretty good turnout. Uh, the first question we asked you was, which option represents your favorite combination of materials? Um, if you recall, option one was a wood look fiber cement with um, a through color fiber cement panel, sort of a gray, dark gray, as well as some corrugated aluminum as an accent to match these terra towers. We did get a lot of feedback regarding the corrugated aluminum, so we're sort of 
playing with that, adjusting how much of that will be on there. Um, we know it was an issue for a lot of people for denting reasons, durability, and heat as well. Um, but as you can see, option one had almost 50% of the respondents say, we want this one. So we are moving forward with the wood look fiber cement, uh, the dark gray panel with some corrugated aluminum in there as an accent to tie in with these stair towers. And just to remind you kind of what that looks like, you see here we have the wood look fiber cement, we have the through color fiber cement panel, and then we have the corrugated aluminum here, which is actually going away in most places, uh, but we will keep it on the uh, chimneys. And we asked you what your favorite unit deck door layout was. Again, option one takes the takes the cake here pretty heavily, which was a three panel slider um, for pretty obvious reasons. You're not taking up any room with swinging doors, um, it's the most glass, lots of operability. Uh, we also offered you a double French door with a window and um, a single door with a large window area as well. And again, chose the three panel slider. We then asked you what your favorite unit deck handrails would be. The first option was, there, these are all glass as the main panel. The first option had a wood top and a second top rail with a little gap in between. It's just a little bit of a level of detail. Um, option two was just a very simple handrail, had a large piece of glass with a simple picture frame of the balusters and top rail. And then option three was a topless uh, glass handrail, which is a technically the right term for it. But um, and as you can see, option option three with the the uh, top rail is maybe is a more appropriate way to say it. Handrail um, was preferred by most of the homeowners. As you can see an example here. What we showed at the presentation, an, an example of what that could look like. They, there's a billion and a half different ways of doing this. Um, this does fit our, our, our budget that we presented originally. So, Which option represents your most favorite choice overall? Option one. So we had, asked, we had some questions as to why we are asking this question to the next, which is uh, which is your least favorite. And these are more of a check. So if if everyone had chosen option three for this for some reason, we would have to ask why. Why, are, why, what is the discrepancy in that? But this reinforces that option one materials want to be chosen um, over option two and three. And option three overall was the least favorite. So by a large margin. And that was, if you recall, um, this aluminum panel had, had some very bright colors. We took a chance and you all prefer the, the wood look, and we like the wood look too, so we're happy. I hope you're happy too. <laughs> any, any questions? Yes, Mike. Is there a structural reason why there are three panel sliding doors instead of two? So uh, this was a point brought up last time, and to repeat the question, is there a structural reason for doing a three panel slider over a two panel slider. Um, cost is one thing, one is weight. A two panel slider over a 12 foot span, I believe some of you have 12 foot doors, are very heavy. So a three panel will be easier to move. It's, that's really the, the, the big one. And they don't make a two panel to that size to meet our performance criteria, which is uh, wind driven rain issues, really. The seals aren't, aren't as good. Yes, so for this, yes, for a smaller opening, um, I believe it's less than nine feet, you'll have a two panel slider. So, and a, yeah. So. Anyone else? Yes? So, on the first question, is the building materials, you did put these bright colors in the last choice. Mm -hmm. My assumption is they could have been muted colors as well. Yes, they could have. 
recognize that difference and would have gone with three over one um, had that not been so vibrant and too modern for a lot of people. It's a Kyle, valid point. could you report, Pete, that? Um, I, I'll try to do a better job getting the mic or the mic. Uh, I'll, I'll try and sum it up real quick. Um, the question or comment was that option three showed some very vibrant colors, and that was intentional. We, we wanted to see if what kind of reaction that would get. Yes, we could do some more muted things, for sure, but the overwhelming consensus was not a lot of color, so. But the materials were still different. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that. So the corrugated aluminum, which you got a lot of comments on, mm -hmm. I guess I don't understand the question necessarily. Well, option one was option one was the only one that had corrugated aluminum. Yes. And I think that was masked with the vibrant colors that it could have been other material types that were in option three. Uh, they could have, yes. Um, but we chose the materials in those palettes because they go together. Um, and there are a billion and a half ways we could do this, as I'm sure you understand. But we needed a direction, and so the direction was muted and wood. So. I think the question was, did you do that on purpose? Yes. Did we use vibrant colors on purpose? Did you know that we would not prefer that? No, no. Okay. <laughs> that, was, that was not the intent. We were not trying to force an answer at all. We, we like all three of these options equally well. They're just very different. I guess where I'm going is a lot of people do not like the industrial look of corrugated aluminum. Mm -hmm. And that, in our final choice, actually could be one of those other materials that were more muted that were available in option three. That's a question, not a statement. It, Can't it, they be? Yes, it could, it could be. It very well could be. Um, but again, that's not direction. We didn't hear a lot of that in any of the comments. For a comprehension check, can I try to ask the same question to see if it's being gotten? So are you saying that the stuff in three, the examples in three that were shown to us were in some vibrant colors, we could, could turn, turn them off, right? Could, could be turning it off? Yes, the bright green could have been a very Whereas muted if, green. Or if three would have had more muted colors, we might have chosen that material. That's it. So, so. It sounded like when you talked about the corrugated aluminum in the first place, it didn't go over too well anyway. And Correct. You kind, of, you kind of forced it into option one. So why don't we relook and why don't we relook this other material in a muted color? Am I getting it? I got it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So we we are we're not taking that that option completely literally. So, so there's definitely going to be some time for conversation about that. Will you just describe the materials in building one versus the, I mean, in option one mm -hmm. versus the material in option three? Yeah. Yes. So option one was a wood look fiber cement panel. It's pre-finished, has a wood texture embossed on it. So it does look rather convincing from far away. You get up closer to it and you knock on it, you're like, okay, maybe what is this? But from a 10 feet and further, it looks like wood. It also includes a fiber cement panel, so it's just a rectilinear shape that is through color. That was a, a gray, dark gray as, a, as an accent. And then we had the corrugated aluminum as a, a third material choice that would um, accent the stair towers. Okay, so, so the question really is in option three, what was the material that was painted a bright color? It was an aluminum panel. Okay, so people, I think, are wondering if you had that same aluminum panel but painted in a lighter color, could you do that rather than the corrugated in option one? Yes, I believe we can do that. There were a lot of people who have concerns about the fact that if we don't do something on the buildings to tie them in with the towers, mm -hmm. 
and what you were trying to do with the corrugated. And folks didn't like the idea of corrugated on the decks because of denting. Right. But putting the corrugated on the chimneys begins to tie them together. Yes. And if you put the corrugated, you could find some other unobtrusive place to put it. Uh, maybe you could achieve some of that versus going to a flat aluminum panel. Because if you do that, we still have the issue of you've got an apple and an orange. Right, so we are, we are not intending to use uh, a metal product in, on the unit decks where a lot of the issue was of people, people were worried about denting and um, I believe it, and getting hot and just being kind of a nuisance. And we don't want to put too much of the corrugated metal on the building. Um, the way the massing works, uh, we sort of divide it by um, several units that are in a block or not, and so the material follows that. So we have a, a sort of a rule of thumb how the material gets distributed, and when we go through that process, it could end up with way too much corrugated aluminum, which is the look that, from the beginning, no one has said they want. The corrugated aluminum was simply a tie-in with the stair towers. And yes, we could absolutely use something different. Um, and uh, of a color if we, if we wanted to, but we are not actually going at this point, we're not proposing that we do that. Um, it would be a, actually have more wood look on it and use that dark gray panel as more of an accent in, in that direction. Did I answer the question? For whatever all that looks like. <laughs> okay. Yes? Um, I, I happen to vote for number one. Mm -hmm. to um, tie into the stair tower, As, if I recall right, when we had our original three options, and they're, uh, they're of, of a variety of things. There mm -hmm. was uh, the choice to put stone at the bottom of the stair tower was tied to stone on the chimneys. Yes, right? that was And that was a big three. number, and people didn't like that. And so I've put in my comments, can we revisit something else on the bottom of the stair towers than the copper stuff that we have right now that would be, I mean, I just have this fear we're going to spend all this money and everything's going to be great, and those god-awful copper bottoms of the stair towers are going to stick out like a sore thumb. Yes. Can we re revisit just covering that portion? We completely agree with you. We hate the copper, frankly. Um, but yes, we are trying to find ways to offset costs somewhere else that we could revisit that and replace it with something else. We're currently envisioning it would be a, the dark fiber cement panel to sort of give it a nice heavy base, and uh, but still tie it into the building. So we are intending at this point to get rid of all of the copper colored metal, if that's what we're going to call it. Yes. Um, my question was, uh, I brought it up at the end of the last meeting, was we haven't talked about the windows at all. And will we be doing that, you know, deciding on how many open, what the sizes are? Because that's a real important part to me for the view, you know. Yeah. Um, Bob, do you want to answer that question? Uh, sure. How do I answer that question? We already have, we solicited comments and preferences for sort of the, a middle priced option, not very expensive, not, you know, teak and not real cheap, the least expensive, but something in the middle. So in that range of products, we have selected some that have the European tilt turn. They get the maximum amount of glazing. They get the maximum amount of vent. And it accomplishes, we believe, the best of all possible worlds. And that's what's in our pricing model at this point. Bob, would you define European tilt? Uh, they have two functions. They tilt out, so you got a set of handles, you pop the handle, and the whole unit, which is big, uh, tilts out this way, or you can pop the handle and they'll, they swing out or in? in. They swing in. So they're a casement or an awning. But it's the whole window. So there's no interruption of the view? Pardon? So there's no interruption of the view in the middle of the window? There's no horizontals, right. That was part of the design goal, was to get rid of that to maximize the view. 
So you have the largest vision panels that we can, but there was also a number of comments from people that they didn't want to sacrifice the bent. So we've got them both. Yes? But no screens of people that have pets. It would be an issue with them, no screens. possibly. They, screens go on. If the unit tips in, there's a screen on the outside. You know how big they get? 55 by 77. 50, 55 by 77, so five foot by six foot? Bob, you need to get closer. Five foot go. by six foot? They're big. That is a really big piece of glass. <laughs> yes. So, does that answer the question well, about the windows? I'd kind of like to see them before. I'd like to see the doors and the siding and everything else, but we're not going to do that. Um, at this point. <laughs> Right, right. Right now, everything's at the bottom for ventilation, so there is no structure here. Well, at this point, what we're moving forward with is to get a price so that there will be a design, there will be a cost, you'll be able to see it, okay. and you'll be able to vote on it. Now, everything, and I don't mean to like put it all up in the wind again, but obviously, before the thing is built, there is still an opportunity to make some changes to it. But at this point, it's a matter of having a coherent design, something that looks good, works together, that meets all the performance criteria, uh, and a cost that goes with it so that we have a complete package for people to look at. I have two questions, because I have the mic. <laughs> the first one is regarding the railings. If option three, that's glass, how does that clean? Does it get cloudy? Is it up to the individuals to keep it? And if they don't keep it up, is it present as something unattractive? Uh, the only time I've seen that it becomes uh, an issue is on seafront homes, waterfront homes that haven't maintained it for years. But in just the normal maintenance of your window glass, you would maintain the glass on the rails. I think it's more the exterior I'm thinking about because you can maintain the interior part of it, but then I'm just curious to know what happens to glass if people don't clean it off from the perspective of outside looking in. Does it eventually get cloudy? And what's, what's the look of long-standing glass that's not clean that's sitting at waterfront? I don't know why it wouldn't get cleaned. Well, because some people wouldn't choose not to clean it. Well, that goes along with, I suppose, everything. I would be, un I would be personally um, uncomfortable leaning over that window, that, that glass without a rail. Um, so um, I'm not particularly in favor of it, but um, I think So I'm going to ask my second question. Um, and I felt implicit in the questionnaire was that option three moves us forward to something collectively more expensive, and I think maybe I was wrong. So option one, two, and three are presented in terms of cost to us pretty equal. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. Would it just be possible to have um, some pictures put up on the website of windows? Sure. Yeah. I think that would help all of us kind of visualize whether we have an issue with it or not. 
Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, one thing that Chris and I were just talking about, too, we're working to get kind of a baseline to the contractor so they can give us a cost estimate that's pretty accurate. Um, we're talking about, you know, a high-level cost estimate, and we will continue to study things after that, and there'll probably be some more discussion about some of the details, but we feel like we've scoped things down here to the point that we're a lot closer than we were several months ago. So I think some of these things will continue to be studied, and there may be some points at which we'll be asking for some further um, input. Okay? Front doors, are the Front doors are in that category too. Okay? okay. Can we move on Let's then? move on then. Okay. Tom, are you ready? I got the pointer. You can do the. Give him the button on the computer. Is that him? Oh, okay. Perfect. Are we on? Is the mic on? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, my name's Tom Ringstorf. This is Forrest Jammer, who works with me. And Steve is also in the audience here, who also has been working on this project. Um, we are here tonight to talk about primarily site restoration of what we have been uh, given in terms of direction by the architect, uh, the landscape committee, and Linda, everyone meeting, uh, giving us direction and primarily uh, getting information from the survey that was done on April 12th that we presented to um, the homeowners and we got our feedback. And since then, we have um, developed a, um, a number of schemes and we're gonna present them very similar to what the architect did, where there's uh, three options and we'll break them down into individual areas uh, based on the information that, again, we've gleaned from the landscape committee, from the architect, from Linda, from everyone that we've had input to, to kind of come up with uh, solutions that tonight you can uh, give your opinions on. We uh, are very concerned with maintenance and cost, the long-term effect of, of what uh, the site looks like, but we also know that during construction, a lot of the land landscape, a lot of the planning will be destroyed or near the building, a lot of it will uh, have to have to be replaced. So there's also thoughts of, of taking plant material that we have now, tagging it and storing it and reusing it as part of a cost saving and um, some of the nicer um, specimen plants that we can reuse in the, the final planning. So if I might just say something, I'm going to be handing out some little surveys that we'll be using as we're going. I'm doing it a little bit early, but I just thought everybody would be poised to ask questions, whatever, as we go. Okay, so landscape, landscape improvement overall, the feel of it. Improved meandering pathways offer circulation throughout the property, water views, and access the shoreline as well as peaceful seating areas. So these were direct comments, direct input that came from the survey that we were then given direction to come up with designs that respond to Item number one. Low maintenance planting areas that are appropriate to scale and use, including ornamental garden plantings, native naturalized plantings, and selected specimen relocation. So again, uh, natives, drought tolerant, things that will save us money in the long term as we look at irrigation needs and uh, as, as using natives that will then, after a year or two of, of after planting, require less and less and hardly any water. So that's Again, part of our marching orders. Visual screening is addressed where necessary with vegetation and views are maintained. So that is an, uh, a specific area behind building two where uh, bedrooms and entries and 
parking and people walking by, we, we're aware of that. We also are aware of the screening potentially uh, from the ferry loading area is also a, a part of our, our consideration. We know the pyramid alice are in there and are getting bigger. Looking at that long term is part of how we're going to handle um, those kind of uh, specific areas. Uh, what, what, we, what will be the decision on the fatinia as you come in the entry and in the ferry maintenance yard? How, how will that look and how do we treat that area? Um, site master plan drainage is improved in the new lawn area, which is reduced in size and scaled appropriately for anticipated uses. So this is a, a big item and it's potential there's things up in the air because of uh, working with CHIP and doing uh, some dye testing of what happens with the drainage, where the stream uh, exits, where the water through the building comes out, why is the lawn always wet even in the middle of the dry season. So that is something if we have a lawn and we would like to have some lawn obviously for, for play and for, for use, but does it really need to be three-fourths of the site under lawn, which is a, from a mowing, fertilization, maintenance standpoint, is a big chunk of what the HOA landscape dues go for. So we're looking at changing that paradigm by reducing the lawn, which is, again, was part of the, part of the survey uh, direction that we got. Future site improvements are accounted for in the layout of spaces and features anticipated in their anticipation. So that could be, and I'm not saying that it could someday long-term be a community center, but there are other things that are looking in terms of around the pool, uh, barbecue use, redoing maybe the trellis or the arbor structure, uh, gathering places, uh, maybe raised beds for vegetable gardens, things like that that can be easily added that, that if we provide a space for them could be included um, in a couple years and if someone wants to kayak and there's only 10 people that want to kayak, why should everyone have to pay for a kayak rack? So if we provide the space for a kayak rack, it could be easily implemented by maybe a group of kayakers. That kind, I think that kind of thought is what we're thinking of a little bit too. The improvement landscape. The improved landscape is an extension of the new building renovation, providing updated outdoor living spaces that speak to the coastal Pacific Northwest lifestyle and surrounding natural environment. So essentially, I'm not saying I'm gonna do a, a French garden or a Spanish garden. I'm gonna do a, a garden, a landscape design that fits with the Northwest and whether that has, I'm not saying it could have, let's say rocks or granite boulders or something, but there's gonna be a feel that, um, that marries the design with the building, the architecture and the site, with the seashore, the landscape, the, nat the natural environment of the Northwest, and um, is gonna be very appealing, but it's also gonna be, again, drought tolerant, um, using probably a lot of, a lot of natives, and uh, design that uh, is appropriate to the site and to the Northwest. Rain gardens and col collect and treat stormwater in a lush visual amenity. So rain gardens are something we've, over the years, have become more and more um, part of the design with civil engineers with runoff or with, with building runoff, with storm runoff. Where does the water go? Instead of putting it in a sewer, why can't we spread it across the ground and allow it to percolate, basically, into the, into the groundwater? The, pr the issue with our site is we don't, we don't quite know. We're sure yet everything what we can do uh, because of the nature of the history of the site and uh, in front of building one, it may be sandier than be, uh, in front of building two. So there's issues that we're gonna still have to explore and discover. If we put a lawn in, yes, we're gonna have to put, work with drainage and we're gonna have to maybe bring in some, gray, some sandy fill to raise the lawn up to make it uh, work, uh, actually work better than what it's doing right now. Okay for us. Shoreline treatment. Planning along the shoreline edge will be addressed with the native plantings. Native plantings will have a good root structure to reduce erosion. So the shoreline treatment is, is still, um, well, we can talk about that, but we know there's gonna be municipal jurisdictions with the city and the feds and, the, and all of the things that, that are coming as part of our design, but we've been given a budget, and there is a budget specifically for shorelines. We know what we can, can and can't do, but we also know that in a high storm surge, I was shown pictures where water and 
the edge of the title uh, bringing debris got fairly close to building one. And I know there's a concern about water intrusion and, and the potential of what would happen if there was a strong high tide and a big wind and getting water into building one and then that would be really something that all of us would be aware of. So how do we work and design around that as well as work with the jurisdictions? Uh, access to waterfront would be improved with two access points. Right now I think if you consider the, the, where the kayaks are stored as one access point, it's fairly steep, there's been uh, concern and, and questions about having a, a handicap or another access point to the water. The reverse of that is, I'm told, is that allows people who are walking along the beach who don't, aren't homeowners, will allow them to come into the site. So how do we work both sides of that equation? So we're, we're obviously aware of that. Additional shoreline improvements, if needed, require coordination with municipal juris jurisdictions on different timelines. So as Linda has preached to me many, many times, this is going to be a different animal in terms of how we're going to get this process, get it done. And it's not going to be in the same timeline as what we know we can do around the buildings. So that's, um, those are, these are our marching orders. These are, this is the direction we've been giving and given, and we are um, excited about moving forward and sh sharing with you uh, the site restoration of aspect of when it's when the sites are served and all the things are happened, we put it back to something that was is going to be matching the quality of the the building and improving um, our our life, our our just our outdoor life of of being um, at home or in on this beautiful site, this beautiful piece of property. Okay, for us. Landscape discussion. So we have, I will go over the site plan, the overview. We have enlargements of the entry sequence, which is as you drive into the site, we've been asked to look at how do we get more of a feeling of arrival and designating our home or our two buildings separate from the shipyard. Not that, it, or not that that's a big issue, but it's still an issue that signage uh, where do we go directions to building one or two and what is what is what does Eagle Harbor say in terms of uh, an identity and we will show you images of that uh, enlargement of building two entries we know there's going to be uh, waterproofing uh, there's issues with the with the garage we know that that as a um, as a design that there has to be specific design elements of how we're going to treat uh, the parking area and the area on top of the roof, on um, top of the garage. Uh, and we, we do a lot of rooftop design. Um, we're familiar with that. This is, this is a little different because normally those are all new construction projects. This is a, an existing project that um, will be treated, we'll have to, to we'll look at it a little bit differently. Uh, enlarged central lawn area, we'll, we'll give you three options for that to, to uh, consider enlargement of the shoreline area and how we are considering removing lawn which basically cuts down your maintenance, the cost of your maintenance, uh, seeing it as a community area and allowing people to walk or providing pathways and sitting areas for uh, areas along the shoreline and then again um, we have four options for the pool area. So let's let's start with the overview. So this is the this is the base existing conditions so between building one, building two. Uh, the trees uh, that you see along the top here are whoops. All right. The trees that you see here are we've uh, surveyed them, and that's pretty much the larger trees that the pine trees, sycamore that are there now, as well as the, the trees here in the ravine. Uh, the planting green, uh, obviously the light green is the lawn areas, and the darker green are the uh, shrub massing. So um, this will be our base, and then we will break off sub areas that we will then give you the options. So um, let's, let's move forward for us. So now we, the entry or arrival sequence, um, we've been asked to look at um, signage and 
how does how does this drive and this project have a feeling of arrival than just parking lot and the sidewalk and and oh who are these two buildings and what's the name of them and how do we identify our home so uh, next slide so we have looked at uh, some options for a and this was told to me like from the early on that we, we need a, an entry sign or some sort of entry monument statement to for a sense of arrival uh, to the community. So we're proposing a sign uh, graphic, uh, some sort of structure as you come down the hill. And then what we're showing here as column ends that there'd be pillars on the, on the uh, main entry drives as you come in to the, uh, to the uh, parking lot here as well as here. Not so much here as much because this is a lot of long space, but because the traffic flow is definitely coming that way. And those look like option one. We are saying more right now that we're picking shapes and we could say that what we like to do when we work with architects is that we like to match the building materials of our signage and our monuments of what's on the building. So if you had stone on the building or stone bases on the chimneys, we would like to see stone. If we're picking option one and there's wood or, or fiber cement uh, panels or something that there's more wood, then we would like to use similar materials on our, our, our signage. What this material is, you know, we haven't decided, but we're, we're trying to match the building. So it's, it's consider that in the next three schemes and more or less what the shapes are. We could do 23 different monuments shapes all day. <coughs> There's so many options we have, but we've come up with three, and I want you to um, just consider um, more of the shapes because we're, we're always probably gonna stay matching what the building is. Uh, next, next game. So this is, could be more of the stone or um, a more natural material. If we, if we ended up with any kind of stone or anything like that, that would be more of this material with then maybe aluminum or a cleaner, more architectural type background for the, for the letters to be mounted on. Uh, again, we're early on and I'm not saying how I'm designing or how I'm, if this is pin letters or exactly what it is, but I want, I want your, your opinion on which sign or which feeling of a sign do I really like before I say it's exactly that material and they, that it's five foot six inches tall and it's 22 feet long. Um, and uh, next sign. This one is, I could say this is again back to um, the wood form. When I first saw it, I thought it could be board form concrete, but we don't have any board form. Well, we could have this as board form concrete, but we don't have any board form concrete in, in our architecture. So again, uh, it's more of the look more of the wood paneling feel, but they would be in bigger panels. And again, this, this could be aluminum or, uh, again, architecturally a smooth surface for us to mount our signs on. So we're, we don't want to get too far away from the architecture, but in some ways you, you can do that a little bit with the monument sign. But I, will, I want the building, I want the, uh, the monument sign and the pillars to tie together with the buildings. Yes. So Everything I'm going to show. Batman gonna sh asked good, better, best. These right. are all selections within some sort of a price. Correct. Package. Everything I'm going to show you tonight, we're all in that same price range. So I don't want to consider price on most of these, I'd say all these schemes. Well, whether well, big picture. Okay, thank you. While I got the mic, I sent a picture of this to, to Chris like two years ago, a year ago. The condo that I own in San Diego, when I bought it, it was Bluffs 1. Not really catchy, because there's now a Bluffs 2, or there was. But now it's uh, the Bluffs at Fashion Valley. And if you know San Diego, Fashion Valley is um, a popular area. So there's some marketing. And so not for necessarily tonight, but for the owners, we have an opportunity to here not just to, to rebrand ourselves, maybe something that ties in Ferry landing, uh, 
that 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 kind of ties in a little bit more for sales and stuff. So there's nothing in the declaration. We're still we're still be the Eagle Harbor Condominium Association, but we can brand the condo anything we want. And when you look at the graphics here, typically we work with a graphic designer. We don't always pick the letters of the graphics, uh, but we, we have a lot, but we're not graphic designers, but if there was a graphic or something that we want to work, or a, a Helvetica or Times Roman or something in terms of the graphics, then that's, that's certainly something that we would consider. Yes? Roughly how much does this cost? I don't, I'm not gonna get into that right now because it's, I want you to take a survey on what you like or what you think looks, uh, is appealing, okay? Well, it seems to me that whether it's worth the expense or not generally is a pretty basic question. But if you want to put that off until later, that's fine. Well, I do because I, I really want to survey on what you, how you see gathering spaces or lawn or whether you want to use that space and not get into the, what, what the dollar amount is. I understand that, but <clears throat> when I look at these things, I say, well, they all look pretty nice, but how much does it cost? In, in relationship to the other components that we're gonna be paying for. Okay, um, everything I'm showing you is roughly the same cost. And I've been directed that they want a monument sign or you want, you want some sort of identity for your project, right? So I, I'm trying to come up with something that I think looks good and everything I show you will all be roughly the same cost. Yes? Am I to assume then that you have a landscape budget you're working with? Well, we've, the, the board has given us a, an overall number to work with. Can somebody tell us what that overall number is? The number that was carried in the earlier estimate, I believe, was 680000 Correct. That's what I was told. And I'm sure that will be subject to further discussion. Okay, but that was in the bottom line for the estimate that we provided earlier. And Lynn, I think there's another three fifty for shoreline, is that right? There was another three hundred for shoreline. So we're really talking about a million dollars. Yes. Yes. Okay, Forrest. I have a I have a question first. Yeah. Uh, the sounds are uh, all, all three of the signs. Eagle Harbor condominiums are, are very basic. The lettering, the picture, whatever it is. Is there any way or reason that you, you couldn't uh, put some type of an art uh, form on that sign, like maybe a steel cutout shape of a steel head or a salmon or something? Eagle. Or an eagle, yeah. Um, we haven't had a survey. I don't. You're asking now pretty specific questions about. I'm tr I'm trying to get. No, I I would say not uh, that it's not a problem. But it's that your opinion of wanting an eagle and someone may want a salmon and someone may want it's. It opens up a huge can of worms in terms of graphic design. So as designers, a lot of times we have to come forward with a start, with what we think is a base, and then obviously we'll get feedback. But um, that's a can of worms that I, I can't uh, really jump. I'm not, I don't think I want to jump into the detail of the and sign right I, now. I was going to suggest, too, Audrey reminded me that you can make some of those comments on the survey. And you've got the little form in your lap. We're not there yet, but we also are going to put it online, and we'll have some paper copies in the lobby, as we've done before. So you have the survey now, and this will be on survey online, too. But here are the three options um, for the sign. Um, and we can go through them later, or you can look at and make a comment now and, and write. So that's, this is for the sign, OK? All right, Boris. So now we have the, uh, the building entry. And we're focusing primarily on building two. 
because of the being on a rooftop and we know that all this, so much of the area around building two and so much of the area next to buildings in general will be, will be uh, destroyed or, or have to be redone and this specifically will have to be redone. So we're looking at this area and we've also known that there's a number of comments for people's privacy because of the relationship of their doors to their bedrooms. So, um, first slide for us. So this is a, uh, a built up planter, planters with, and then I have a, a section of it too, gravel around the edges of the planting area, stationary planters with varying heights to complement building colors and architectural style in a more formal uh, planter arrangement. Um, so the, the light gravel you see is, is gravel, it uh, could be pea gravel or a stone, and then there are built up planters uh, around that. So we know we're building on concrete, we know we have to deal with drainage, we know we have to put irrigation in, uh, but we're, this is how we're starting for option one. Um, Forrest, go ahead, number two. So that's, this is a, a section of what that would look like. And it won't exact, we're not saying exactly how high the planter is, but we know we have to have a certain amount of soil depth, and we have to have drainage, and we have to have irrigation, and there might be lighting in here. Uh, what the material is exactly on the planters, we haven't decided yet, but it's more, I would like you to, to look more at the shape and the feel of, of the design versus having us tell you that's concrete or Corten metal or CMU block or uh, stack piece of, uh, you know, individual stone, uh, concrete. Okay, next. This one is a alternative where we're providing more of a actual outdoor living space where you could actually have furniture and use um, space out in front of your uh, home with planting and paving. And these are uh, pavers um, set on pedestals like you see on a number of rooftops in Seattle, and it's a very common system that we use in Seattle. So we have stationary planters with various heights to complement the building, and then we have uh, terrace or patio areas. And again, this is another option that the people in building two may or may not like at all, but it's just, again, it's an option that we want to explore. And that looks like, again, the pavers with pots, stationary planters against the face of the building. So it's more of a, a usable hardscape area with assumed furniture than the other scheme, which is more planting. Okay, and the last scheme is maybe more of a combination of planting with gravel. And again, we could do a number of schemes that we're trying to get either your comments or vote or even write down uh, suggestions of what you would see here. Uh, with gravel edges around the planting, stationary planters with varying heights that complement the building, colors and architectural style, and a uniform planter arrangement. So this is more of a, a design style and not the outdoor terrace type, type space. And that would look again, again like this. Um, I mean, when you look outside the building here and you see um, these really good looking concrete planters in the planting, uh, it's very attractive. Uh, and in a lot of areas we're on, not here, but in a lot of areas uh, you wouldn't know you're on top of a parking garage. And that's the, the effect we're trying, we will try to uh, provide you with. Okay, so here are the, the three options. Again, if you want to write notes or vote or, or whatever. Yes? I just want to understand the uh Right now, there are uh, planters that are four feet or five feet deep, I believe, in, in front of each of these units. So is that being filled in? Is that the idea, or am I missing it? When you say four or five feet deep, you're saying there's four or five feet of soil? Yeah, I believe so. Um, Not that much? Oh, is it just a couple of feet? Okay. Yeah, it's just a couple. All right, so are, are you planning to fill that in? Is that what that? No, well. We haven't gotten to the detail of that. If it's too deep and we and it's a soil or weight issue, we'll put styrofoam in, okay? Like we did at Harbor Square. But two feet is sort of a minimum if we want to have a decent sized amount of plant or have uh, to work with. Well, I, I, I thought like in the case of number two, it looks like those planters are sitting on top of the, but that's not the case, the planters go down. Correct, I see. right. 
I right. understand. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, next grouping. So here we have the lawn area. And we have obviously lawn in front of the building one and then we have a large lawn area in front of building two. Uh, the survey almost unanimously wanted to reduce the size of the lawn. Uh, not everybody, but it, a large majority because of the maintenance and the amount of lawn uh, that is being maintained, the cost of that, as well as the poor drainage that is uh, year round. Um, so we have to look at how will we, will we construct a lawn that's usable, um, but make a lawn area that uh, I think people agree on is, this is about whatever is the right size. And again, if you have comments about you want more lawn or less lawn or, or we missed the mark on lawn, then we need to hear that. Okay, so option one has um, brought, we're still keeping the lawn in all the schemes because uh, we feel lawn is usable from playing catch with your grandkids to uh, just an area to walk around and have open uh, visual connections to spaces. So this has um, gravel seating areas on the perimeter. Let's just say for these, a lot of these schemes, the main walkway would be concrete. Right top of my head, I'll say concrete. But there'll be seating areas um, here that, uh, pardon me, seating areas that will be potential because again, in the survey that and the landscape committee, giving us uh, input that that would be great to walk, have places to walk to. So these could have uh, maybe stone boulders, uh, furniture, benches, something that's very attractive that fits in with the natural landscape, but it's an area uh, for sitting and gathering, uh, and there'd be a number of places around uh, the walk that come out from Building Two that come up from the parking in both places that then head out to the, to the pool and out to the beach. We're also showing rain gardens again that we are going to really try hard to make rain gardens work from a um, sustainable design uh, using runoff from the roof and not having to put water in sewers. That's our goal and, and we think rain gardens would be very attractive and uh, how we plant them will fit in uh, overall with our, land, with our overall landscape scheme. This is uh, option two. Uh, it's more of a, a little more edgy of bringing kind of an artistic uh, flavor of panels, gravel panels, and making what does the lawn look like throughout the year uh, as a kind of more of an artistic element by running uh, diagonal lines through the lawn. Um, the sitting areas here would be connected with maybe uh, a paving stone or something where you'd have a sub area to sit here that you then walk to another area here. Um, we're not showing the pyramid Alice or how the planning is, but we know we'll, we're, we're gonna have to resolve that area. We're, we're looking at bigger pictures tonight of overall um, site design shapes, connections, um, where the paths go and, and how the the a pedestrian we get from the parking lot to the pool. So again, the gathering spaces was very strongly recommended by the survey as well as by the landscape committee and the direction we got from the, uh, from, uh, from the architect. Go ahead. This one has a little bit different shape on the lawn because we are uh, gathering with, with more of a circle with a planter coming out of the garage and developing these nodes with our paving to another node that is then, again, walking around the lawn and then having two gravel seating areas off that might be, could be a little bit different planning if somebody would consider that maybe they wanted to look at um, more color or something that's a little more maintenance intensive or they'd be willing to take care of the sub area um, in, 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 uh, in a, in a, uh, I'm going to go out and garden here for, you know, 
every weekend, and this would be my kind of my space to garden. Again, that's an idea, um, but it gives us space to do that. And the rain gardens then are both here with a connection pipe and a, a bridge. Uh, it's kind of a faux bridge, but it's really gives the intention that the water is, is connected so out to the uh, path to the beach and a sitting area here. Okay, so those are the three areas. All of them um, are kind of roughly the same size for the lawn area, but the gathering spaces are, are all different. Okay. Uh, yes. yes. In relationship to the current lawn out there, I don't need that. Uh, <laughs> how big is this lawn compared yeah. to the one we have now? Um, let's go back for us to the to the first <laughs> overall site or there. So if you see, you are probably in that space now with the new lawn, so you've, you've probably shaved it by maybe 25 percent? I don't know about 50, but I'm just throwing, I'm just throwing that off that it's more of, I'm not going to get into the whether it's 50 or 25, it's, it's certainly smaller. Yes? I'm not clear on the drainage. There is an outflow that comes out on the beach. Is that coming from the groundwater or is that coming from the roof water? And so I'm not clear what gets tied into the sewer and how we divert what makes what's flowing onto the beach now either continue to flow or at least not back up in the For swamp. So the, uh, the drainage that comes down to the site which a lot of this starts up on the entry drive coming in. There's a couple of catch basins along that entry road that are part of this whole system. They are collecting water from the road and bringing it down and where you were talking about where it you know, displaces out on the beach, that's where everything's coming in. We're also collecting water we discovered from the creek that's coming in that discharges into the vault that's just on the kind of the water side of building two, and then runs its way down uh, and discharges out into the beach. Um, we've got several small drains on site, uh, small like yard drains. Those are also going into these catch basins, as well as some of the downspouts that we could find uh, were coming in and leading to these uh, various catch basins that are either in the drive aisle or they're you know situated in the lawn areas. Okay, but are you saying that the current catch basins are not sufficient? Will the rain garden help to disperse all the water more slowly so that that area of lawn by the pool is not a bog? Or yes. Is it, so the reason for rain gardens isn't simply to decrease what goes into the sewer system. It's to dry out the usable lawn. It's, it's kind of a mix of things. You're, you are trying to you know, collect the water from these areas and allow it to infiltrate naturally. Uh, the soil makeup in that lawn area has got very heavy soils. So it infiltrates at a very slow rate, like fractional per hour. Um, when I was out there last week, I was digging, digging test holes and we had, you know, several inches of clay. And then when I would remove that component and pull it over, five minutes later, all the water would start running into there. But the soil underneath that piece that I lifted out was moist. In some cases it was dry. So the water is not effectively infiltrating because of the soils in there. The water that's going through the catch basins and coming off of the, of the roofs and going in, that's being moved very efficiently. The surface water, the storm water, which is primarily what it is, is the stuff that's hang hanging on the surface and is slowly migrating to the yard drains but it's not infiltrating as fast as we would like it. That's why you really get that kind of boggy atmosphere out there. So does the rain garden solve that? The rain garden will, sef will certainly help with that uh, to remove that water. But I, I think we, what we need to say and be real clear about, the intention here is to solve the boggy, soggy 
lawn areas so that that does not occur in the future. And we think based on the analysis that we, investigation that was done last week, that we've got some ideas for doing that. And the rain gardens would help with that. Mm -hmm. And we also realize we may have to put in some uh, under drainage under the lawn as well as bring grade up and raise the area, uh, raise the lawn itself up. So there's, there's still exploration and, but we're starting to get a better handle on that. Anything else? Yes. Uh, well, you, for example, you comment about the general philosophy here of maintaining this large area of grass that we all look out into uh, while maintaining the perimeter that none of us can see from our homes. I mean, why are we maintaining, or why are we continuing to focus on this large grassy area in the center of everything when that's the area we look into? And, 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 and instead, we're just sort of continuing the same kind of style of a perimeter of plants that nobody can see from their homes. Well, we're looking at the entire site, okay? All these schemes I'm showing you is the entire site, other than maybe a little bit in front of building one. But. Um, well, it's the same design we have now, essentially, with the lawn shrunk a little bit. Well, are, are you saying you want a radically different approach? I, I'm not saying what we should do, but this design seems to me. This basic, basic design of this large lawn area, even if it's smaller than we have now, means that we don't look out in our homes on anything of that, that we're putting in here. What we have now is a large lawn area with a, with a perimeter of plants that we don't see from our homes. You don't see what from your homes? We don't see the plants that are in the perimeter of the grassy area from our homes. They're below the window line. You're at, what are you advocating? Lawn I'm, I'm advocating that we should be that the plans that were offered should include something that that in, that gets rid of the lawn that that just replaces it with something that's a very creative a very waterfront feeling kind of thing perhaps that does include boulders that includes structures that that become part of our view instead of looking out over all this stuff that we're going to be replanting and we'll never see from our homes. Unless you're out in the walking in the yard or in the lawn, you're never going to see these areas. Um, okay, I, I'm still not sure how I would respond to that because um, you walk in your garden, you walk outside. If you're in your home, you're looking at your view, I assume is what you're saying, right? And you're not looking down at the landscape? You can't see it. You can't see it because you're up high and you're looking no, over. I'm on the I'm on the ground floor, and okay. even I'm on the ground floor, I can't see the landscaping in front of my windows unless I stand right by my windows and look down. It's not visible from our homes, um, and this won't be either. That's I I don't know how to respond to that. To be honest with you, yes. Some of the some of those like the large. Okay. No, that's fine, but we don't. But that's not something that I'm able to enjoy from my home. The only people that are going to be able to see any of this are those that are out walking in the yard. And, and that's fine, but that, that's not. I don't think that should be our goal. Well, Carl, I beg to differ because if you look at the the rain gardens right there, you're going to be able to see those definitely from from your um, from your unit. There is there will be to the um, the pool, if we go with something like on the um, option two and option three, if you look at the design to the far right, both of those would definitely be um, uh, points of interest for you. To be able to look at. I agree that there's some improvement because the perimeter is larger in these plans, but it still, it seems to be, be wasting this space that we have in front of our eyes and instead just shrinking the amount of lawn that we have. It's a little less, but it isn't enhancing the view particularly to just replace or to shrink the lawn. We're still stuck with a lawn view. Well, I, 
I think it's a question of yes, shrinking loan. But what you're saying, if somebody wants to go out and play croquet or badminton or have an open space to do that or catch, where would they do that at? In the park. In the park. Yeah. Go up to the park. In the new park. Yeah, we've got scads of really nice parks around us. Okay. Uh, well, the, uh, all right. Houses, you know where we're at the public house restaurant? You know where the yeah. public house is? Yeah. Have you seen that condominium complex there? Yeah. I think he means something more like that, like with a gazebo in the middle and just guards and walking paths, but no lawn at all. I don't know if you've seen that the complex there, but that's what I think he's envisioning. Me too, to tell you the truth. But yes. maybe that's it. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that you've got to be very careful about is, is, uh, is plants over time that uh, when, you're, when you plant foliage for, for view, it does not, in a lot of cases, stop growing. Um, <laughs> you, you end up, and it, it sort of does look like the, that one up on the, on the highway uh, you cannot see very far into that center because the, it is all plants. So um, this, the, the, the lawn gives us uh, empty space to, to uh, reach out and you get, uh, you get space in there and beyond that and around that we can, we can make sure that lots of lovely plants are placed so that people from, from building two have a, a lovely view uh, of plants in the distance and plants around the edge. I, I think that it's possible to do that. It's just that we haven't been very creative with the plants we put there. It's kind of boring right now. And we just don't want more boring. No, we don't. So, uh, but I think with uh, rain gardens <coughs> and um, taking some of the lovely flowering plants that we have around our uh, property that we can um, fill that in and make that a, a real lush, lovely place. And then people can bring their grandchildren down into the middle or they can sit out there on a bench, but they, but they're going to see a, a, a much more beautiful garden. <coughs> it's just that we, we haven't been very creative so far. It's true. Hi, I just wondered if there was something wrong with our existing concrete paths that they needed to be ripped up and put different concrete paths versus... Well, we're going to raise the grade of I foot. see, so the whole thing has yeah. to come up. Okay, right. thank you. Yes. On April 12th, or when we did the survey, I showed pictures then, and we can get them back up on the survey, but yes. But back when we were presenting over at the Senior Center, we had we showed pictures of a lot of that, those they, things. They are on the website, too. If you go back into the folders, there's an April 12th folder, and in that presentation, they are there. <laughs> Any more questions on lawn? What I would recommend, too, is that all these comments that we're hearing, that you incorporate them into the comments on this yeah. card, or you go online and incorporate them into the comment section there, too. Do you have a question? Make one quick comment. I kind of like looking at the kids playing ball down there during the summer a little bit. All right. I don't mind people chasing their dog around and, and uh, playing with the dog. So I, I kind of think some lawn can't hurt too much. Yeah, I agree. Okay. So now we have the shoreline. The, uh, the shoreline has, um, because of, I think, the issue with bulkheading and how we're going to treat the edge and how, it's, how the, the storm surges are, as well as people on the ground floor and their privacy and their concern about people coming up under their patios and how do, that, how do they feel about that area. So. Th I'm aware of that, and um, but I also think we need to look at maintenance and again whether there's lawn. Right now, it's all lawn, which again, from a fertilization, irrigation, water use, maintenance cost to have someone with a lawn um, needs to be reconsidered. So um, we have uh, looked at um, three different schemes of a walking pathway 
for the community to use. And we're trying to push the path as far or as close to the edge of the water to be away from the units as we can. But we see this as a, uh, an area that we've been given direction to provide walking paths or circular walking paths around the property where people could um, enjoy the entire site and walk uh, around um, building one as well as the lawn area and maybe parts of building two and as a as a general let's let's take an afternoon stroll after dinner let's let's go out and, and enjoy the water so that's these are um, gravel paths and the gravel would be a very small tight gravel that we would then roll and put a bonding agent in so it would be a um, it wouldn't be like asphalt but it would have a French kind of a French garden path feel to it if if you could visualize that um, there's sitting areas, potential sitting areas uh, here that are represented with chairs and whether they are stone or uh, how we connect, we haven't really resolved how we, we connect uh, individual patio homo homes out to the path and the getting feedback from the homeowners specifically in that area is something we want to hear from you um, folks about. So that is uh, the scheme, 18-inch uh, max height berms, because we know uh, sitting down in the chair, people in uh, units on the ground floor are concerned about their views, so this is a, a section of what that would look like. Yes? So does the 18 inches include the plants? Does the which? Include the plants. Are you putting an 18-inch berm, and then there will be a plant of 12 inches on top of that? Um, to, to be still decided, I think. So it wouldn't, I, I'm just concerned for all my neighbors, they not lose their view. I know. So when I add 18 and 12, now I'm up to more than 18 inches. So we, I think what we need is someone to say specifically, berm or no berm, 18 inches straight across is the height, uh, or could we break that anywhere at any certain time? Is there a functional purpose for the berm? There is in terms of, we've thought, from a storm surge or from a protection of the, of the foundation. If the water got high, the berms would push or help push uh, the water away. And I've thought more about also doing a design where there would be some sort of mini wall or something that, that would be uh, as part of the design that you would step over uh, that would protect, again, from a, not a big surge. It's not going to present something. But I haven't. I don't know the history. The history of, of what. I've seen debris marks from how far the water got a year or two ago, up near the building, and maybe that we could help protect for that kind of access. So yes, there's something there for that. I think what he's saying is you don't want to have water drain into the units because of that berm. That is, that is problem, so we would install we would install yard drains or a drainage system to to to, to not ha yeah correct I understand that right not create a bathtub type effect right. So this is this is again our first blush our first pass of high, trying to work with the jurisdiction using native plants, um, trying to figure out what to do with storm surge and not block views. So it's a, it's, it's a lot to consider in a, in a very tight area. Okay. Don't you think, don't you think part of that would be uh, resolved? For instance, I mean, how close are those chairs going to sit to my front window? But, um, but don't you think that reinforcement of the, of the, of the, uh, of the shoreline itself 
would do a, go a long way to protect us against surge? I haven't looked at the design. I know there's talk about design of how the logs are going to be pinned uh, if when we get into that. But again, unless the logs stick up or, or a barrier or block the view, water could still come over there. So I think there's a, a, a uh, how do we design something that solves both issues? And I think that's, that's going to be the, the, the design problem for, for our shoreline. Um, there's also potential of, of how we not plan up against the edge, but maybe do a gravel or a pea gravel or a drain rock uh, edging around so that the planning is not right up against the building. And so those are smaller details that we're not showing here, but we would certainly consider. So the big picture is, is on this design is that we, we put in a, a low grow, no mow type of orchard grass that um, I've used on a lot of school projects because of uh, maintenance and budget and, and irrigation and that we consider something that's, um, I mean, it's fairly inexpensive. You mow it once a year, uh, but it's, we could put uh, flowers and uh, smaller, smaller grasses. There could be some, um, a, a, let's say a variety of mix that they have that we've used in an orchard grass type situation. So that's, that's something to consider uh, for here. And then we, again, we're keeping our path edge out along the uh, sea, but we're bringing our nomo or our low grow up against the patios. You can consider walking on it. It just, we're not providing paths, but it's, it's a different look. It's more of an orchard grass look. Uh, so we have a sitting area here and a larger sitting area there with no sitting gathering places along the front, primarily. Uh, berms, 18 inch berms are smaller on the edges and not in the middle you know, on this scheme. Okay, Forrest? So I got to speak up here. This is more as an owner than a board member. I was, but both. Uh, some owners came to me when they heard at meetings that they were talking about a path around building one. I am concerned about that. I went to the renovation committee and I told, was told that that is only being considered. You, you characterize it as a requirement. Um, I'm very concerned. I, since I've been the board president in the last two years, in the summers I walk from my unit, which is on 118, the end closest to you, down to the pool. I feel very, even though I know everybody on the ground floor, I feel very self-conscious about how close I am to their now three-pane sliding glass door. <laughs> There's not a lot of room there. Um, and, and particularly in the middle, it opens up in the end. I sit in 118 and, and watch people almost cross my patio. Um, and now I look, um, well, I guess every deck has access. Is there a deck that's going to be isolated because of foliage that you can't walk out your back deck? Um, I, I have to say, as one of the people on the ground, there's only eight of us, I would like to revisit this requirement and who has putting it there. Um, it also, as you said, I sit there in 118 and watch people that don't even live there come down to that corner by the shipyard. Um, and so I'm not sure, and signs don't work. So I'm not sure anything that we're going to do to promote more people. There is a path along there. It's at, it's along the beach. So I have a real problem with this. And I think everyone that lives on the ground floor has a real problem with this. And we're paying for everybody else's decks. We're, we're, a, we're contributing to a lot of things that we don't have to deal with. And so I think we need to be considered 
as a group on this ground floor thing. End of speech. I know it's, I mean, it's not to you, Tom. It's, it's to the, uh, the landscape committee and all the people that somehow think this is a good idea. I also am in 118, um, and my concerns are very similar, but one of the things that I would like to see an option for is like for building two in the front, why not in the back, which is extending the patio area, even if it's gravel or something, so that outside area could be more usable. I'd like that if I was in your ground floor too. Yeah, that'd be that would be great. I don't know from a HOA or or what your yeah uh, how that works out, but I'm sure Mike, you guys can you know work that work that out, obviously. But I would like to see that as an option as well. Well, that, that's easy in in terms right. of your comment. That's easy for us to add. Um, whether or not everyone would want that, or individual units would want that, or somebody might want it, and some wouldn't. But you have to check the footprint. Yeah, well, I'm sure what the HOA has said, you're, you own this far out, right? Or you, yeah, yeah. this is your, and then the rest is common space. Uh, yes. Hi, um, so um, I'm an owner too. I'm not on the board or the president of the board or on the renovation committee. But Mike raises, I think, an excellent process point, which is we're being given forced choices. All of the options here that Mike has to choose from and that we have to choose from have the path, but eight people out of eight owners out of the 50, however many there are, don't want the path. It's probably also true that at least eight and maybe more than eight of the owners here don't want to spend any money at all on new signage. And yet, all of the signage options that we were given are spending money on new signage. There are people in the room, probably a lot of them, who would like to spend as little money on landscaping as possible because the only reason that they want to do anything here is to preserve their existing home not to improve the landscaping. So I encourage the ground floor owners in building one to just vote none of the above on this selection, if that's how they feel. And I encourage people who feel like I do about the first set of choices, that is about the entry sequence, to vote none of the above on that. And I encourage the board to uh, to make sure that you know the guidance that has been given to uh, the various working groups is actually consistent with what the board wants and that we're following a process that allows everybody's voice to be heard. I don't live on the ground floor, but, and I don't care if I can walk around both buildings, but, it, and I, I can't speak for what the renovation committee, but in my comments, is where I'm going to express an option that I might be interested in that uses the spaces not directly in front of any of the units for pathways. But my real concern is, is I don't think you should be walking along that bank with erosion issues. That's where the native plants might need to be to affect erosion. So it may be possible to protect everybody's land by decreasing erosion and simultaneously protect those people on the first floor from having a lot of people in front of them. It seems like we have an awful lot of space where there can be paths that don't literally have to be on the shoreline only in front of that part of the building where people see. I mean, I know it would not be a circle. It would be a U-shape. Um, but it, 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 I'm, I'm concerned. I, my biggest concern for all of us is that that shoreline be protected. And after that, um, and it's all, I don't know how a path would affect that. But anyway, I guess more constructively, 
I'm gonna make some comments so that we get a sense for whether it is just eight people who feel that way or whether there are a lot of us who would give on that but would rather have the lawn smaller. I, I want to just insert something here. The shoreline issue in terms of stabilizing it, one of the primary thrusts with that right now, at least in our bag of tricks right now, is putting and planting plants along that edge in greater numbers that will um, create a heavy root structure that will protect both the vertical edge and the first portion of the flat surface on that edge. And um, we've gotten a lot of feedback from the city that is saying that as well. And so um, that is going to be one of the major pieces that's looked at in this process. I guess what I would like to suggest is, is an option. One of the things that we don't have is decent access down onto the beach that isn't an erosion area. And if our two areas of access are going to be the ends of the beach or we're going to put one in the middle, I think a lot of us really prefer to walk down on the beach uh, when the tide's not in, obviously. But um, I think we could solve a lot of that problem if we had paths that came to places where you can actually access the beach and not have to climb over logs um, and, and that it is stabilized. Okay. I am very open to any suggestions. I am not pushing a path along the edge. Uh, where, where we want to access the beach, whether it's uh, closer to the ferry here or obviously down where the kayaks are, I'm fine with. I, I want everyone to, to have a say and have everyone at the end of the day be, be happy with our design. Not that I don't think that ever is totally happy, but it's many people uh, at the end of the day said, I really love living here, this is a great place and it's a wonderful uh, garden, great place to walk around. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm just, one of the things that I would really actually like, particularly the first floor people to comment on, is are they, will they be okay? Would they be okay with no more grass versus the pet? Assuming the path is not there, would they be all right with the no more grass? So if people could comment on the no more grass. In Did everybody get that in what terms is of no more <laughs> grass? It's orchard what, grass. And what does it look like? So it. Um, I, we can put pictures on the website, but it's a it's a grass that's that's if you consider an orchard, probably 14, 12 to fourteen inches tall, reaches a max height, basically, right? And it has some clover in it, and it has uh, maybe a, an English daisy, or it has some flowers in it. Uh, but it's essentially a grass that gets to a certain height and stops growing. It doesn't take uh, it takes very little water. Um, but it isn't a grass that's going to be very tall. It, it's a, a dwarf grass, I, is what we'll call it, OK? Burned grass? Kind of grass that's been burned? A what kind of grass? Kind of grass that's been burned? It's in a berm? Oh, whatever, right? Yeah. When you're walking on the beach and you're walking through the berm, you're talking about that kind of grass? No, it's not a, it's not a beach grass. Okay. Right. It's an orchard. Let's say, an orchard, eastern Washington orchard grass, maybe. Yeah. I could describe it like that. So I think this is my opinion. Let's go to the extremes. If, you, if there was something there such that our deck became a boundary that didn't have a rail on it, but you couldn't walk out because it was either too dense, too nasty, too difficult, I think then that we'd have to go in and out the front door. I think that restricts us. Un, un, necessarily. I think, I don't think it needs to be all grass. Um, I like the idea of being able to expand the deck and sit out on the whatever right. beyond the deck. Uh, and I realize that the other people can't do that.
but there's other things that they have and and I, I don't so I, it's it's a unique situation to those eight units I don't think it needs to be all lawn I'd like to see some common it kind of like what you did in the other grassy area where it's a combination of some sitting areas it can be gravel but some access to something that you can sit on out in that area you mean for each individual patio would have a sitting area? Not no. each one. The no. community would have There's a sitting like area. Maybe there's three along the area there, something but, like that. But we would not. Maybe you could have a sitting area. Um, I, I would be fine if there was no grass along there. I think that kind of thing there, with your no mow grass. I didn't realize it was a foot tall. Yeah. But I mean that, and that's not just that's not a view thing. That's just can you walk through it? Yeah, yeah, you can. It's but I mean, it's not I've, gonna be like I've been there's places where there's a foot tall grass and you get cut if you walk through it, right? So I don't know. I, I'd like to see and I know I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth, I would like to see some ability for the people that live there and some other people to be able to come down to that area, but that a path, you know, uh, um kind of promotes yeah. Are we going to see people out there doing their three-mile walk, going round and round on the path, and, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, stuff like that? Uh, well, again, survey, comments, I will, would get direction, and if the, if the path gets cut off here, and, or here, I know you're there, but it, they only go this far, and people could only go this far, and there was access to the beach here, and there's access to the beach there, then those are the comments that, that we can work with. Um, we're starting out with, with ideas and we need your comments. And if you don't like no mow or if you want grass or if you want all native ornamental sea, seaside uh, woody ornamental planting uh, and the city approves us, then we would, we would go in that direction. So we're, we're trying to start the process of feedback and design is what we're trying to do. I want to point out one more thing here. One of the primary reasons why we really need to look at this is in, in here as around other buildings, around building two and one on the back side, is that with the construction, we are going to be tearing up, not intentionally, but just with the construction, these areas fairly significantly, just about out to the water at the narrowest throat probably. And, um, <coughs> we will need to restore them when they're done. And so we're looking at solutions that would be better in the long term once the building construction is done. Okay, can we move, move on first? Okay, so we have the pool area here. One more question. Yeah, oh, sorry. sorry. This, this really isn't a question. I, I got a suggestion though. I, I really don't have a dog in this fight at all. I'm in the other building and, and but I, I, but I listen to the comments here, and I think that the people on the ground floor of Building 1 have a unique set of problems that maybe have been in existence for a long time. And I think it would behoove you to try and get a feel for what all these problems are. And maybe you're getting involved in the, in the redesign of the building or something, but I think that you should take it upon yourselves to say, the problems that the people have in building one on the first floor ought to be one of the prime motives for solving this whole beachfront area. And I think maybe you should ask them to give you a list of what is their per personal concern, whether it's safety, access, vision, whatever, and then make that part of your problem. Okay. Uh, anything else on what we've covered so far? All right, the, the pool area. Um, the pool area is obviously open from May till what, October? Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. And it's closed in the winter. So there's some thought or some ideas that maybe there could be an area where you could use part of it uh, throughout the year in terms of, let's say, a hot tub. But survey direction said we don't want a huge kitchen, we don't want to spend a lot of money there, but maybe we could enlarge uh, area for barbecuing, or we could have another option for barbecuing. And the arbor and the trellis are really uh, not doing very well, they're maybe falling down, or we don't like the, how they look, 
can we look at something there as, as a sun cover or sunscreen or some sort of roof structure around the pool so in the summer, uh, if it's really sunny out, we, can, we have, could be undercover or if we're barbecuing in the rain, we could also have um, some sort of uh, place to, to cover while we cook. So let's, let's look at, so this is a little bit more of, uh, say, an ex extreme uh, design, but including a number of options is that um, we have maybe rebuilding the arbor structure, uh, putting in a raised uh, spa or deck here so that the spa sits above grade. It's a typical spa that you would buy from Aquaquip or a, a company where you set it on a concrete slab and you bring the, the, the power over to it, but essentially you fill it with a hose. It isn't like the pool. It has its own uh, set of chemicals. It's like my hot tub at home. And uh, it's a standalone uh, hot tub that could be used in the winter when the rest of the pool in the hot tub is not in use. Um, this also shows uh, raised ve vegetable garden beds and potential conversation areas here and here, which could be maybe a fire pit or table and chairs or something near the beach. Uh, the scheme also in uh, enclosed a dog run or dog park area, and what that means is that you fence an area in so that people could be have off leash, take their dogs off leash and allow the dogs to have uh, freedom to run and not be on a leash. And we thought this was a, a, an excellent area behind your, um, when you walk back there, it's kind of, it's really not, it's a very underutilized area. So um, there was some concern with some of the pet owners that they would like an off leash area for their, for their pets. Um, raised beds um, are something that the gardeners or people who garden would like and how we uh, divide that or rent that space is, is still to be determined. But we, we've put them closer by the water and away from people's views because there's some people are concerned of what raised beds look like in the winter. Uh, my raised beds at home typically have a cover crop and so they're always green and uh, full of a six inch type of um, seed mix that makes them very attractive throughout the winter. So it, it isn't like the corn or the peas are just left to rot uh, in the winter. Uh, you can see the uh, rain gardens here, uh, fencing area uh, around this entire area. Uh, but again, the shape of the pool stays the same and roughly the, the concrete but we've added access points here to the pool uh, as well as the existing site. Okay, um, next slide. This is a um, little different in that we're providing pavilion structures or some sort of, not to be decided whether the, what the roofing material is, but the barbecues could be in two separate um, covered structures so that you could, you could have a, uh, I would say, when I barbecue, there are times when it is raining. I want to barbecue, I want that steak on the barbecue, but I've got an umbrella or I have to wear my raincoat, but this allows me to, to do both. We're moving the uh, arbor structure around to this side of the, the site, and then we're maybe changing materials with a, actually a, a wooden deck that is flush with the lawn, um, but it's just changing materials. And then we're having, again, gravel or conversation areas that could be a fire pit, or um, that's kind of really what we're saying, is that there are two places for potential fire pits, and then the lawn uh, area around here that could be great for laying your towel down, or if you're, if you're swimming and having a place to go uh, with a lawn area, like, kind of like we have now, um, assuming then the fence would be on the outside of the pool in the lawn area. One uh, rain garden there in, the, in this space. Okay, next one. Uh, this one again is a bit different than the last. Rain garden here, but what we're doing is we're changing the entry of the, of the pool access point to a kind of a node that then brings you in on this corner. Again, with our pavilion barbecue structures here, the arbor uh, element there, uh, paving has been squared up 
So we end up with a third barbecue area here. We could, instead of having the off-leash area, we're putting the raised beds in this area uh, to help hide them a, a bit more. And then a gravel multi-use area, which could be fire pits, could be bocce ball, could be a number of different things. But um, whether uh, you could like some areas or some things in one scheme, and some options in the other scheme, please make those comments. And that's what we're looking for. Yes. So what kind of fence is around the pools and what kind of vegetation? Right now it seems like we have this <coughs> tremendously interesting, uninteresting, is that what that is? Fotina all the way around the pool. Is that going to be changed? And what kind of fence around the pool? And my other question is, you kind of indicated this access point to the beach. Is that the existing one? Or is no. that a new one? No, we're, we're proposing a new one. It's probably okay. near the existing one, but it's a new one. We have not decided what the fence is. We know from a health department standard that it has to be a certain size opening certain and self-closing gates and those kind of things. Uh, we have not picked out the plant material yet for what's in. We know that the planting around the pool was put in there for wind, so that we know that that's an issue. With when you're sunbathing, where you're swimming, I know there was an issue with wind. So we'll need feedback back from that whether that is still an issue or people want that, or whether you could did it with a something as part of the fencing. Um, you know, but with the screening or, or adding the planning around here and you can't see out to the view, it it's, creates another problem. So again, we're, I think we're gonna be aware of that. Yes. This, the spa that I showed you? Yes, because, because I'm handicapped <laughs> or somewhat handicapped. I'm definitely very well of providing access to that spa, to that to that hot tub. Correct. Yes. If you if we can go back for us, I'll show the there was a. So here's the ramp that goes to the. So here's a ramp, raised deck. Okay, and then the pool with the hot tub would sit maybe 24 inches above this deck. So that you just spin if you're in a chair, wheelchair, or um, easier as we get older to sit on the edge here and then swing your legs in. So it isn't like the hot tub is flush with the deck. It sits up above the deck. Well, I think that <clears throat> this, what I saw here, you completely ignore entire existing condition. We have entire, we have uh, <clears throat> in a pool, uh, area with the, with the equipment uh, which is quite expensive and uh, that shouldn't be ignored. It's not. Tom, uh, where, I don't where, is it? It? Uh, where, where is it? Where, where is it there? There is nothing. I mean, sure, sure. Why, why you should, why you would put uh, uh, this spot right there when we have already well, that's where the existing lawn is right now, the spa. Yes, yes. But why the existing equipment well, we, we already have a... Uh, building around, Eva. We're, I don't think so. There's a building there. We know there's a building there. We're not, we not going to destroy the building. We're not going to get rid of the pool. If this is a, if this is a graphic error, then it's, then it's our problem, and, and I apologize. Yes. Building there, which isn't shown on any of your drawings, which all our equipment are in, we cannot change that. We realize that. We are we are not moving the pool equipment, okay? That just, just show there. that's that's our fault, okay? I will admit that. Hey Thomas, it's uh, of all the areas that we've talked about, 
this area in particular falls under the heading of a master plan. I mean, there's nothing that has to be done immediately in this area, but we do want to plan in the context of the entire site what might happen here in the future. But this is a master plan. Good point. Right? Right. I mean, of all the areas we've talked about, this, this area here <coughs> is most of the master plan. Yeah. Did everybody get that? Yes. Perhaps, uh, perhaps what I'm about to say is covered by the comment that was just made, but uh, I love hot tubs. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that you've talked about is great stuff, but I personally uh, get aggravated uh, with proposals like this at this point in the process because I don't think it's necessary. The stuff that we need to get done, which we still don't know what it's gonna cost, but we're talking about a million bucks aggregate. I don't think we should be looking at doing anything other than maintaining this pool area until we know what everything else is gonna cost. That's, that's fair, very fair uh, statement. Yes. So is this part of the $600,000? This, this, no, we did not, well, I had a, a, a separate number of that, okay, um, but only for the hot tub was the number. Um, we didn't do the roof or the structure or the arbor or um, the raised beds were part of that 600, but that's a very small item. The hot tub was a, was a separate area, was a separate, but that, um, that was not, okay. Okay, next. So the last scheme is bringing some lawn area down uh, in front of, uh, on the edge of building one, redoing the, the path as kind of a, a really small tree that isn't gonna block anyone's view, okay? Uh, but it might be 10 or 11 feet tall at, at height, and we, we thought maybe one tree might be a good focal point in terms of like a piece of art. Uh, but again, uh, most people I think from building two could certainly see over it and as you look down, even from the first floor, it, it's not gonna block their view um, in terms of being similar height with the arbor structures. So we have uh, arbor structure, uh, paving, a pavilion structure with barbecues on the other end of that and a dog, off-leash dog area on the north. Um, so these are our four schemes, and as Chris pointed out, again, it's more of a, a master plan decision, but we, we would still love your feedback in terms of um, you're saying, no, I don't want anything to do with the pool, or I don't like the cracks in the, in the deck and the paving on the pool surface is uh, maybe needs to be redone, or if you have comments like that. Uh, would like to hear that. I was just thinking that maybe we should just explain master plan once more, meaning that there are things that will have to be done in terms of restoring the um, areas around the building and integrating the drainage into that and working towards further stabilizing, enhancing the shoreline to protect the property and then there are things that perhaps would be done over a longer time, and we're trying to make sure that any th actions that are taken as part of the building renovation project don't preclude some of the longer term actions that you might want to take as a community. And so that is the reason we're asking about some of those things that may not be funded up front, but need to be integrated into an overall plan and it becomes a, um, kind of marching orders a guide to guide future actions in terms of where things would be placed. And that's why we were trying to talk about it now, so that it's going to be integrated, the drainage, the restoration of the landscape, the stabilization of the shoreline, and all these different pieces and parts, because there will be a fair chunk <coughs> of the site that will get torn up with the building renovation project. 
just in moving materials around the building with equipment and access and landscaping will be damaged in some place. We're going to try to remove large pieces of landscaping that um, folks feel should be maintained, tuck them in temporarily, and some of that would start happening as early as this fall if the project proceeds. And then um, those pieces of landscaping would be saved to be tucked back in later in, in keeping with the plan. It shouldn't. So when we're talking about a master plan, any budget for any of this should be not even included in this whole budget. Correct? The only the only piece that might be included would be the drainage related to that in terms of its integration off that the westerly side of the pool area. Okay. And is there ever a problem with too many people using the two barbecues we have? Mm -hmm. Never. Do we, do we Think that we need more barbecue areas. Okay, just check. Um, it would be nice to have a little bit of privacy if you want to have a dinner, you know, a dinner for four, and you don't, don't, you know, your own personal friends, and you're not really. So, I particularly would like to see them more separated so that you could have more and more a sense of this was your own dinner party, not somebody else's. Two questions. Um, the areas on the parking lot side for building one, what's envisioned there? And then do you have like a picture that puts all of these options or some of the options together so we see the whole effects? I can't tell in your option one here if those are the same two rainforests that you talked about underneath the very first grouping. Garden. No, I mean, we try to separate everything so that you're not voting or not saying a survey from, I want that whole thing. We're trying to break out the sub areas. This, that was the direction we... No, we, I get it, but is this the same two rain gardens that were illustrated? So this would show... This would, this would be a little bit different rain garden because the paths are a little bit different. So then we could have four or five different rain gardens in the when you put all the pieces together. N no, there'll never be that many. There's never more than probably three. Probably two to three at the most. They would be located in the same proximity, Kathy. I mean, if you were to look at option one here and the rain gardens that are up there, and they would be integrated in a way that would make sense, where the water would flow and how you would get at it. So they're not exactly overlapping your right. They're not exactly the same, but they would be positioned in the same general area, depending on how the path ended up being placed. It would be nice to see a picture of some of the options all put together. Great. Good comments. And what about in front of building, parking lot yes. side of building one? Yes. Um, that is an area where we know will be um, trash. Trash, how far. Um, but yes, we, we're going to replant that. But we didn't see a huge change in terms of path layout, I guess, and sidewalk relationship to the parking and how you get to the front door that we would make a lot of changes in that area other than the planning would be changed. And we know everything against the building is going to be trash. So that, that'll be replanted. Those two big islands or two and a half big islands, where the, one has where the transformer is and then the other two islands will certainly get plan it along with the entire scheme that we're doing for the site. And that's part of the, the money that's, that's been allocated. But we, didn't, we did not choose to make three options in an area that we didn't think had a lot of options that we were going to try to do. Some of the concepts, though, that would be developed for building two might be applied behind building one as well, if those were um, elements that the community Embraced. Yeah, if, if the parking structures mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Was any consideration given to privacy screening on building one? Because there are bedrooms that are facing there are bedrooms that face the parking lot area on the ground floor. I think that's a great comment and I think we should put that in, in your comments on the survey. 
but I guess my question was, was that considered? Again, the area, um, we did not see that area as, as, as big an area right now. We will look at it, but we, we didn't develop schemes for, for that, no. It has been discussed in the Landscape Committee about that need on both Building 1 and Building 2. Yes. Um, and one of the, just to piggyback of that a little bit, even something, I mean, my mind thinks about needs versus wants versus, but one of the things as a, as a um, relative to where I park and safety, I, would, I hope that we also look at access still to the way the traffic flows into Ward Building 1. Um, and those of us that walk from our parking spots home and how that flow of traffic comes. So I don't know where the safety committee is with this, but I hope they'll also have, a, have some feedback for this process as well. Are you talking about from more of a, a safety standpoint, visual standpoint? Yeah. Um, okay. Down to building one, and you hang a left to come in. Mm -hmm. If you're parked right in the first three stalls, you've got to be really attentive to what's happening because some people zoom down there. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. I I parked in that same space when uh, I've been on site, and so yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Any more questions? Or do you want to? Okay, so owner input tonight or on the survey monkey, obviously. Uh, we will then develop a preferred option, and that's where we will show the overall site as uh, you'd like with all the options put together into one overall um, site plan. Drainage improvements and final shoreline recommendations incorporated as the final design. Um, Part of that's going to take a little bit longer because of what it's going to take from a municipality recommendation and direction. Uh, and then the final design option cost estimate will be on the June 21st meeting. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Yeah, any more questions? Yes. Um, maybe this is a question for you, Mike. Could you talk a little bit about the process that you envision, the board envisions right now? I'm curious about the process that you envision after the, after the June 21st meeting for giving the project a go ahead. You mentioned at the board meeting perhaps accelerating the schedule from the, dis from the, from the previously discussed September timeline. What do you think? You should never ask me what I'm thinking. Uh, so I guess I'll say a couple things. Uh, I, thank you very much, Tom. I think this is great. It certainly has generated a lot of conversation, and that's important. It's kind of funny. We've had people come up to us along the process and say, when are we going to be able to give our inputs? Um, this is the process. This is where the inputs need to be given tonight and, and about the buildings. Uh, I'm very happy with the process. I mean, I'd be happy in some cases with what's being decided, but that's okay. I mean, I'm one of 56 owners and so, but we're gonna have to get there with a the consensus and these kind of conversations and the follow-up and the other people who aren't here, that's why we try to use the microphone. It's not so that Tom can yell in the back of the room and be heard up here. It's all those people that aren't here won't hear it when they watch the video. Okay, so this process, when we get to June 21st, um, that's where you're gonna see at a very high level, this is what we're gonna do. I know that, okay. Now I will also tell you if someone were to ask me, what's been the biggest challenge of being the board president for two years? I would say without a doubt and clearly the highest thing is landscaping. There are 56 owners and at least 112 different opinions on what landscaping should be. There's no, 
And what and I've thought about this a lot. It's been very frustrating for me because it's not necessarily highest on my list. Um, but everybody has an opinion, and unlike the building, there's no standard, right? So until we get some sort of a plan that we can, and, a, and an expert, a, a, and, and, a, and a landscape architect, and we can work together on a plan, then all of a sudden we kind of have a standard. Then all of a sudden it's not everybody's opinion, it's, well, how, what, how does this do related to the plan? So I'm all for getting to the plan. Now Chris will tell you the one area that we probably still disagree on to some extent is landscaping. When we started this a year and a half ago, almost a year and a half ago, I didn't want to talk about landscaping. I said, well, we'll do the renovation and then when it's done, then we'll talk about landscaping. And and I think I was rightly corrected on that, you can't do that. And I agree with that. But I also hear all the comments about, well, we're spending $12 million, 10, plus, 10 to $12 million on the buildings. How can we afford, why should we go do this landscaping? And, and the challenge there is if we don't do it, and let's say we get to an approved assessment, how many of you are going to be interested in the next two years to see another assessment to do the landscaping? This is the challenge, right? We either put it in the plan and figure out how we're going to pay for it, or it's going to be really hard to pay for later. And that's the dilemma. And, and the truth is, in the, in the $13 million budget, there's an allowance for landscaping and shoreline. And I, my personal belief is that will adjust up or down as we get closer to what the real cost is going to be and we know what the insurance money is going to be. And then maybe, in, in, in the, I, as always here, there's people in the room who say we should do less, there's people in the room that say we should do no more. Okay, that's, we, we clearly have those different opinions. But as we go forward, we need to be thinking about, well, we need to do something with the landscape. We can't just leave it as a barren wasteland war zone after the con contractors leave. And I think we're just going to have to work on that. And then and also agree that there's this plan. And then we'll have to figure out how we're going to get to the plan. So now I'll answer Vicki's question. Um, as, as you all should know, we've hired a general counsel. And that general counsel has a lot of experience uh, in how we get from here to there. And so while I was in the Caribbean, he sent out a fairly long email that says, here's some of the stuff you got to do, which is, you know, one thing is getting to a point where we kind of know the scope of the work, we kind of know the cost, you know, but then there's a process that has to be followed to meet our declarations, to make sure the voting is legal, and, and most importantly, who was, if you remember the Tower Project, Tower One Project, you know, we, annual meeting in June, it got approved, new board, we thought we were going to break ground in July, August, and it turned out it wasn't for several months because it took us a while to get the paperwork right for the loan. So there's other pieces of this besides just figuring out what we're going to do and what it's going to cost. So the answer to Vicki's question is I have, uh, I sent a note after I got back and I could sit down and respond to his comments. I sent a letter back, the board sent a letter back to the general counsel and asked them to give us a schedule based upon the 20, now 21 June date. Um, that is a combined annual meeting and renovation meeting. We'll keep the, we'll keep the annual meeting very, as short as we can, approve the budget elect new members, and then go into this. Um, so I hope that by June 20th, we'll have a schedule that we can show. I think we can 
move forward on approval of the assessment and possibly collection of funds to enough to get started and get started more in the early part of 2018 and still <coughs> allow those that need a little bit more time to get their money together to do that. But that's all stuff that I have to talk to the lawyer about. And finally, while I'm up here, the trial started today. I was there. Um, sorry? Yeah, this is fine. The trial started today. Uh, we, uh, the morning was uh, taken up with jury selection. I'm, I'm happy with the jury. Um, the afternoon was primarily opening statements. One for us, four for them. There's four insurance companies. And I started my um, sorry, uh, testimony. And we stopped and tomorrow Chip and Steve and probably Laura. So the uh, plaintiff is, is starting to state their case. The trial is expected to go 10 days. That's not 10 calendar days. So it will go into maybe the second week of June. Um, the good news is we're coming up to a point where we'll have, we'll know, maybe, we'll know um, how the trial is going to go. There's still a possibility that the insurance companies would want to settle, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so I'm optimistic that we're at least, we need to get this thing resolved and still be working towards getting um, the maximum uh, judgment that we can. So. Um, trial is, today, is this week through Thursday, and they take through Monday off. They, know they don't have trials on Fridays. So then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week, and then if it's not over, it'll pick up again Monday, the first Monday in June.